Uh, yeah, this is the uh, unconscious processes session, and our first speaker is Yi Jun King, and I usually call him Jun. Uh, and he is a professor from the Institute of Bra uh, Basic Science uh, in Korea, and his talk is about the influence of subjective visibility on conscious perception. First of all, thank you for having me here. And then I realized that my talk is in the unconscious processing session but just the day before I arrived. And then I realized that it fits me because I don't really practice my talk and then I don't even know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> so it fits me. <laughs> it's all just unconscious. I will leave it to my stream of consciousness. Okay. So today's talk is the influence of subject visibility on conscious perception in report paradigm. And uh, so our lab usually interests in the dynamics. Okay. So when you hear this music piece, the two measures of the Beethoven fifth, and then when you hear it, uh, when you hear the first note, then because you are so used to this sound, like this music piece, and then you can imagine, and you can immediately expect what uh, next pitches will come to, will come in following this first note, and then at the end of the note, that they want to finish, then you can also kind of imagine that the whole thing, the first note that you heard is still in your perception, right? So, but uh, what I want to today talk about is when are you aware of the sound that each pitch and then each sound in this case, each stimulus, okay? So our lab is interested in mostly using this uh, EEG and we are interested in brain dynamics of mental representation. And then when you have the record while you're listening to music or the, any stimulus, you know, these days people use this technique a lot, multivariate pattern analysis. At every time point you do it, then at different time point you look at the pattern of the activity, and then you, when you have two conditions, you try to you know separate them, how how much they're distinguishable. <coughs> but then you can do the you know the trait at this time point in here, the T1 time point. And T1 time, training time, your decoder is trained at that time point and then you apply to that same weight all the way to the different time point. And then whether that thing can be generalized different time point. In that, it, if you do that, then you will have this kind of thing. So this is the training time point and this is the generalization time point. And then you can see how the, you know, when you are, uh, after you hear the first note, and then the around the 10, 100 millisecond later, you can, the, your uh, decoder was trained, and then you apply to the weight to the all the way to the different time point. Then you can have the this red part is where it's general significant generalized, generalized, and then the, this diagonal part is the where the every time point we we say is a dynamic coding and sequentially different time and each time point has to be corresponding. The pattern is corresponding, but this one is a sustained activity, right? So this time point trained data will be generalized across all different time point. And then you can kind of, the pattern, how much state and dynamic coding, the diagonal part is, exists during, by calculating the, how much the state and its dynamic coding index and then this one is the recurrent processing, sustained activity, how much your mental representation is maintained across different time points, stable uh, coding index, we call it. And then you can see, you can summarize this whole 2D map. And then this way you can kind of uh, summarize what kind of coding format in order to represent the sound or the any other kinds of stimulus. So then, what we got from the normal experiment is uh, this. So 
today, someone talked about the, this audible paradigm. And so you hear that repeated, repeatedly. So most of the time, 70% of the trial, you will hear this do mi so, do mi so, whatever different kinds of the repeated pattern. And then the deviant pattern is different sound, okay? Slightly different. And this is we <laughs> at the end. <laughs> and the third one is if you keep repeating the standard one at the at the, at the last moment, there's an omission. Okay. So then you can now because recover all these different notes, pitch using this model-based decoding population half model. And then what you do is, okay, this is the first, let's say, do. And then the moment when do, this is like a confusion matrix, when do is kind of played. And then you see whether during this moment, what kind, what other, info, other notes information exists, okay? When you hear the do, you can expect the next one, B, and so. So, huh? it's not the third, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so the, the first one you hear the this is actually presented tone, and then at that time point you reconstruct that mental representation of the first note, and then at the when this one is played you can also play and uh, you can also reconstruct the second tone and last tone. Okay. And then <clears throat> for this standard condition, and the second tone was played at this moment actually played, you can go back and the, whether this activity pattern still has the information about the previously played sound. Okay, this is this that information. And then this one is the the next tone, okay? And, then, and so on. The third one is played, and then I can reconstruct the previously played the two sounds. Okay. So then, what I found is you can summarize this 2D map into the dynamic coding index and then stable coding index. So when you look at this diagonal tone, this is where the actual tone is played, and then reconstruct that tone. Then what happens is this dynamic coding here. The first one doesn't show that. But the second one and third one, when even before it is actually played, there's a starting to coding the second tone and third tone, even before it's played. And then the stable coding index, there, even the remote one and then the before and after, I mean the second, second, and then this one, when third one is played, and then the stable coding is exists for the first tone. And then when first one is played, then the, th the two fourth note representation can be reconstructed. So then in this case, you, you can see it's a dynamic coding for the transient uh, pre-onset current tone, and then stable coding for remote mnemonic and the previous predictive tone. So for audible, so audible case and omission condition, maybe this one I'll just talk about. So the third predictive tone is the standard one. So do mi so, do mi so, do mi so, do mi so, you keep hearing that and so will be, should be reconstructed. But then actually presentable is the omission, I mean the deviant tone. Then you will have uh, this uh, to the coding format, and then you can subtract which one has more, you know, the strong representation. Then, before the actual tone is played, this moment, you will have the off-diagonal uh, decoding. Then this one is kind of corresponds to the, your audible ELP kind of pattern, the response. Normally you see the P300, and then this, the dynamics wise. <clears throat> so then, when I saw this one, uh, 
I was just wondering the you know when you see this one you, when you get repeatedly hear the same similar sound like a Beethoven many many times then you will have this kind of parallelly at the same moment one note is played or even before it's played you will have a past present and future tone reconstruction in your mind in your brain but then I was just kind of reading something else. Bojar said, when I feel well in a good humor, or when I'm taking a drive or walking after a good meal, or in the night when I fall asleep, cannot sleep, thoughts crowd into my mind as easily as you could wish. When and how do you do they come? I do not know. I have nothing to do with it. And then later on, he keeps going on, and then he can kind of starts having some humming sound, and then the, in his mind, work this, all the melody kind of grows and keep expanding it, conceiving it more and more clearly until I have entire composition finished in my head. Through it, maybe long, then my mind sees it as a glance of my eye, a beautiful picture, just one steady picture, or handsome view, handsome views. It does not come to me successively, with various parts worked out in detail, as they will later on, but in entirety, that my imagination lets me hear. So I was just, when I saw that thing, the confusion matrix kind of rec uh, reconstruction, this one was kind of similar to what he said. And then, so when you hear this, you will probably, you didn't notice it, but you were like, you, you, your brain representation reconstructed. Once you hear the first sound, everything is kind of the following notes will be all represented immediately in your mind. But then, this was statistical learning, the, the, the old world, traditional paradigm. It can happen without you actually aware of it. Okay? But then now I kind of wanted to know to when you are actually the aware of this sound. And so this is where I searched the uh, literature and then I came across this one. And then when are you aware of the stimulus uh, after or before its representation? So there's one theory hypothesis is when it's presented. When the stimulus is presented, the conscious perception time up to your sensory input. So this is usually at the recurrent processing in the visual area or sensory area. And another one is the, you know, it's kind of time-wise is flexible. Later on in time, it can be reactivated. And then even if the, if, as long as there's some residual activity in sensory area, it can be recovered, saved. So then the she, the sergeant, she had an experiment with the retro cue experiment and some threshold level stimulus is presented but then before after uh, the stimulus is on she showed some cue okay valid or invalid then she found that you know even after the stimulus is gone the your perception or uh, the stimulus identity can be recovered so then she says there's a flexible uh, conscious perception, not time lock to the uh, actual sensory presentation. So then the, I also look at the, what kind of paradigm people use in the consciousness literature. And then this is fame, the backward masking, forward backward masking paradigm with the target change. So then they show brief target and then masked with a strong high contrast or different level of contrast or target or contrast can change it. And then they get the all this, you know, visibility report from unseen to the totally seen. And then they vary the target contrast. And then this is number of response that, you know, how many times they report as a zero visibility or three visibility. Then accuracy was, uh, Looked at, they looked at it at zero visibility, they just kind of translate. And then this is where they compare the brain response. But then 
they look at the same thing that I did, right? The, you know, the, gen the temporal generalized method. And then, but I found that this, for zero visibility, you have this different kinds of con target contrast. It varies. And then this one will bother me because it's maybe this high, sometimes this high contrast level, although it stays there, is unseen, but then maybe this decoding was kind of possible because of this high contrast target. And, and also the simple feature, like an orientation, they can be tuning curve can be reconstructed from all the anesthetized monkey or cat. So I wanted to have something that is not that simple target. So then I found this, came up with another paper with the, this Kaniza. Although this is a still kind of low level, but mid level, <laughs> V2. So then this Kaniza, you can have this Pac-Man, but still you can have this, seems like the square there, and then this is the this triangle shape. And then they look at the attentional blink, traditionally kind of, for T2, uh, target two, this thing can be unrecognizable, depending on the, the timing, like a rapid visual presentation. So like, when you have the this first target letter, and then the target, will be second target is with X, you have to report, but then depending on this interval between the first target, second target, you will have this kind of drop. Your performance goes down. So this is how kind of manipulate their conscious access. But then what they found is the, you know, uh, even though the short duration supposedly generate the uh, visibility zero, but then they could still recover brain representation for the Kaniza. But then when they, but then they also intermixed with the random, uh, randomly intermixed with the, this, immediately after this target, there's a high contrast mask. Not just the attentional blink, they also put it to the mask. So then I, this one is, there was no visible to report. And then this decoding dynamics was diagonal part only, dynamic coding part. And then this intermix with the, uh, what is it? Uh, attention of link together with the masking. I didn't like it. Sudden, it suddenly makes people kind of, maybe they couldn't recognize it because the, you're total, suddenly kind of exposed to a different situation. So what I wanted to do was without Without low-level physical feature of the target Kaniza, and then just backward mask stimulus contrast service, all the same. I just want to have the, all the different kinds of the visibility report. Okay, and then look at the this full representation of dynamics as a function of uh, visibility. So we did report EEG, and then we had this four different target of triangle, Kaniza triangle, and the control was the rotated, and the mask was the rotated, but then doesn't form any uh, Kaniza. So we show, it, this 40 millisecond was determined, we want to have the 50% performance level, okay? So behavior is determined that way. And then we have a 200 drive per each of five target and block design and visibility is zero is unseen and seven is maximum clear as possible perception. One to three is the feeling of having seen something and four to six is foreseen, okay? Depending on how you feel about it. And then they have to tell us one of the five target and then visibility. So this is the experiment. Yes. 
So this is the data, okay, behavioral data, and then from the zero to seven, visibility around the kind of, you know, average visibility for the cape and the first Kanisa and second Kanisa, fourth Kanisa. And then control was the, they could see well. And then performance correct for the Kanisa was around the chance level. And then this is the for at each visibility level for so full Kanisa performance correct and then control performance correct and this is a total. Okay? But then now I want to so then since the, the total performance level is around 0.5 for the Kanisa, like the the PNAS paper, like the the Kanisa paper, we look at the total and we look at the diagonal coding for total condition across the all condition data. So we look at this kind of the dynamic coding. But then I want to, as I said, I want to look at the, as a function of the visibility, we want to look at the, how the, this kind of coding changes depending on your visibility report. So then what we did is, um, when pe some people use a seven, but some people don't use seven, okay? So then what we did is, for the, we ranked the, all the trial, thousand trial, from the correct one to the top, and then most visible one top, and then the bottom one is the totally invisible one, so incorrect and totally invisible, and then in the, from the two extreme, and then we kind of, in the middle of it, it's funny, fun, uh, fuzzy, fuzzy state, right? Because you, sometimes you get it wrong, even though by mistake, even if you saw it clearly. But then sometimes you totally not seeing it, but you get it right. So then in the middle of the visibility or the performance, it's all just kind of fuzzy state. So we kind of from the the most visible and correct one to the you know order to the tour to the center from the invisible to the incorrect one to the tour center. And then this is how we divide the data that way. So then Kanisa one, the maximum visibility is 0.72 and 5.526 to the you know visibility, uh, lowest visibility is like one. And then performance correct is kind of decreasing. So what we found is the, this, uh, 2D map, so in the beginning, visual area, it seems like it's a dynamic coding, and then there's a off diagonal stable coding, and the central parietal and frontal is kind of slow, and it kicked in later. But then, as I keep showing it, so in here, when the visibility kind of drops the most below than 3.5, then the frontal activity decoding it starts kicking early, and then the other visual and the parietal areas kind of start kind of diminishing. So I look at the stable coding index and then dynamic coding index. As you can see, as visibility drops, stable coding index kind of disappear, which means the your visual and the parietal area coding getting weaker and weaker. But then frontal part is as visibility decreases, your frontal coding of the, in this case, Kanisa, increases. And then I look at the, this part, where it's below the your average visibility 3.5. Then we divide into in more detail, kind of shifting the data in the different part of the data. Then we can see this uh, frontal activity is still only there, but then this, you know, the front and the parietal and the central part and then the posterior part coding that disappears. And then when totally invisible and close to the uh, invisible case, then you don't see any significant coding. So this is the summary of the, the finding. So this is the whole thing, whole thing so as you can see, you know, the, as visibility decreases, you seem to have the 
um, posterior and central kind of disappears, but then frontal it starts early and kind of more dominant. Okay, and this I felt like this one is like a, there's a, some bifurcation in spatial temporal brain dynamics depending on your visibility and your confidence. So this is the uh, additional data. <laughs> so, so I'll show you this, only this. Okay, this, you saw this, the most visible one. And then this is the less, least visible one. And then we only look at the diagonal part. And then we look at the our behavior, okay? Their kind of visibility is zero to seven and then also correcting for it. Then what I found is that this central part, in the beginning, your visibility for this high visibility, low visibility correlation happens all year, but then your performance correct is related to the later part of the coding, in the central part, uh, posterior central together with the central, okay? So, the, I recently look at it came out, and then probably he will today, 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 or tomorrow. Book, book, the Hakan book discussion, right? <laughs> he will talk about more, but then I. So in here, this IIT, this kind of thing can happen when you have the continuously flashing the stimulus, on the, or leave it on forever on the screen. Then you will have this like this. But then normally in the elaborate condition, if you show brief stimulus, then you don't get to really see this kind of thing. And uh, so in our case, you know, it seems like there's this kind of thing, there's a additional, to me, I never ever really get to see this kind of, when the stimulus is off, there is a, some coding change, even after the, it's about the, it let you know about that there's a stimulus disappearance. So I, in the, during the laboratory or EEG experience, I never get to see that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, that prediction was too much ideal to me. So anyway, so my summary of the data is this. Subjective visibility changes your spatial temporal brain dynamics and information processing. So, like, uh, so dynamic coding and stable coding is involved. And then the when is high visibility, posterior and central area is dominant. And then low visibility, somehow anterior brain area, it starts kicking early and coding. But I really don't have a good idea about whether this is, when you have this neural representation, shows up, then I don't know whether you will be corresponding your real perception. Uh, I feel like, like, you know, the uh, initial statistical and audible paradigm, you get to all parallel coding representation, but you never really know. You, you didn't know, you didn't know your coding all three at the same time. A brain that did it, but you didn't really know, right? So then, like, the same way, I'm not really sure. Maybe I want to discuss about this. Okay, this is my uh, talk. I have a small thing for budget Smith. You, you said that trans level was at 50%, but was it not the five choice task? Yeah, ah, uh, okay. So, in the behavior, Total things, the chance level in here is like a point two. Yeah. Right? The when it's been visual. Yeah, it's a five choice, it's a point two, but then in here, the, uh, what do you say? Um, uh, so this is the, ab this is the average of the. Uh, oh, this is a hit rate. Given the stimulus, how likely they say? Wait, wait. Um, this data is the average of all seven levels. 
So, so that's why it became ended up like this. But then when it's invisible, the chance level is, should, yeah, you're correct, it should be pointed, like in here, in, in this one. So, uh, how do you explain the this finding that when the visibility is low, but you still have decodable yeah. um, information in the, in the frontal area? So, when I first saw it, well, I felt like the maybe slightly that what Claire Sargent was found found from the flexo cube. You know, when it's invisible, um, when it's invisible, and. Uh, you want to rescue it. I don't know, maybe somehow this frontal kicks in at the same the moment that it has to recover, then maybe it kicks in and then try to recover that information. But I want to discuss, I don't really know. <laughs> All right, so we, uh, because of the time we have to move on, so uh, please thank our speaker again. Alright, so our next speaker is uh, Takashi Obana, and he's currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Yale NUS, and his talk is about surprise-induced deafness. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Alright, uh, good afternoon everyone, I hope you are having a great time, and uh, you know, I'm going to talk about surprise. And I hope it will kind of uh, you know it will be interesting and wake you up uh, from food coma. And so um, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, introducing RSVP paradigm earlier because I'm going to talk about it. Too. So all right, so I'm really enjoying this uh, conference because like the more I hear, like I hear. I see dots and then the more here the dots start to connect and because we are all uh, trying to figure out what consciousness is or the nature of consciousness and that I think I'm a clinical psychologist so like I, we are naturally kind of drawn to phenomenology because uh, like it's kind of devoted to describing human experience and then of course Husserl uh, he has a very unique approach to consciousness so he says consciousness is not like an empty box but it's more like an act so he turned intentionality to kind of uh, describe the nature of consciousness consciousness is not just an empty box but it's always conscious of something so like this intentionality is very appealing to us clinicians and it also draw, drew me to uh, attention when I started doing uh, experimental psychology. Uh, so it's been cra crazy like, uh, like with the advancement of technology we have to process more and more information so this is quite scary like it's kind of exponentially increasing the amount of information we have to process and it's it's just getting more and more so the um issue of attention is becoming more salient i think uh because uh, selective attention kind of uh helps us to filter out irrelevant information and enhance the information we have to process so it's like a lens and you have better resolution in the center and then you can kind of blur things out on margin so that's the bright side of the attention but it has dark side as well so when we attend to something it creates some kind of dark spot at the cost of uh, increasing resolution to kind of attend to something so that's, um, I think psychologists use many metaphors. So they use the metaphor of attention of resource. Uh, so like when you invest certain resource to attend to something, it kind of depletes uh, attention of resource to uh, process other things. 
So um, there are two major kind of processes psychologists have postulated. They are goal-directed attention and stimulus-driven uh, attention. So one is uh, often voluntary. Uh, so it's like intentionally trying to focus in a noisy situ situation. And then uh, stimulus-driven attention, which I'm going to talk about, is often involuntary. And uh, it's like being uh, our attention being drawn to something very salient, like a loud bang outside or stuff like that. So uh, this is a uh, RSVP. So I don't have to explain in detail anymore, but it's like this. It's very fast, and you have to be attentive to kind of process what's being presented. So attentional blink, uh, same deal, like first target and second target, and if you manipulate the temporal proximity between T1 and T2, uh, the performance of T2 suffers because you invest your top-down, uh, you invest your attentional resource to process the first target, and that depletes the attentional resource to process the second target. So um, there is a depletion and recovery. So when you put T1 and T2 far apart, uh, the performance won't suffer anymore, as you can see in this graph. So this is called a attentional blink window. So that's one way to kind of uh, see the dark side of attention through top-down process. But um, there is another way to kind of interfere the attentional uh, information processing. So that's through by surprise. So this paradigm is called surprise-induced blindness. So uh, if I told you to um, look at the RSVP and then report whether you saw X or not, and then you, on a unexpected, unexpectedly, you insert a surprise surprise trial and present face uh, three items before the target and then the detection of X suffers so this is attentional and not perceptual as you can see it's not the masking that caused the attention to fail to process the X it's there right in front of you the physical, it's physically there, but it's not processed. So this is called by attention, uh, stimulus-driven attention. So we have uh, attentional blink uh, that uh, represents goal-directed attentional limitation and surprise-induced blindness. And there is an analog to uh, attention, visual attentional blink, which is called auditory attentional blink. So what about stimulus-driven limitation um, showing auditory attention? So uh, before I go on, I want you to see this video. It's quite intuitive, but like it tells you what how our attention works. The sound is. <laughs> So this is a very cute and uh, kind of intuitive video, but what you see here is called orienting response. So when you hear something unexpected, you orient your attention to evaluate what's going on. So that's called orienting response, and this is another video uh, about habituation. So there is a very surprising sound 
and then the mouse is surprised in the beginning and trying to see what's going on. So he's evaluating the situation, but he kind of quickly learns it's not tied to anything uh, harmful to his survival. So that's when habituation occurs, and although despite the intensity of that sound, he is able to ignore it and just uh, continue with his, uh, I don't know, uh, activity. So that's called habituation. So it's a surprise uh, because there is some unexpected information presented to you. So that causes surprise, so it's caused by violation of expectation. And I'm going to talk about this uh, process at the very end of the talk. So um, if you can remember the matrix of stimulus-driven, goal-directed, audition, uh, visual, so can we like observe surprise-induced deafness instead of blindness? So that's our first question. And then, is it sensitive to manipulation of informational surprise, like the rarity of the surprise, and then the homogeneity of the surprise? Uh, so if, if it stays constant, is the habituation faster? And then, is it different from the goal-directed limitation? Is it really tapping onto stimulus-driven limitation? So I, want, I would like to talk about those three uh, research questions. So this is a rapid auditory presentation. So this is the analog of RSVP. So I think many of you haven't even heard of this paradigm yet because it's not that common. Usually it's uh, RSVP because visual experiment is nice. Like you get clear result like uh, Hapan talked about it uh, yesterday. So it's like a piano keyboard. But it kind of becomes a bit blurry when you tap onto other sensory modality. Uh, so, but um, let's see what we get uh, by tapping onto the auditory uh, sensory modality. So it's a bit harder. So this is the target tone, uh, 4,000 hertz. 4,000 hertz is uh, often used in auditory um, ex uh, experiment because it kind of pierces through and it's very salient. Okay, so this is 4,000 hertz. Present? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So far, so good. So this is 4,000 hertz again. Works. Okay. There was 4,000 hertz, but there was some unexpected sound. Uh, I'm quite happy with some of you were shaking head. It doesn't usually work in this kind of setting, but I don't know why, but today it works, so uh, I got lucky. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great. So, like, this is the uh, experiment I did. So, if you can, as you can see, there is target 4,000 hertz, and surprise stimulus is like uh, A or I or spoken words. So, I used... Um, uh, 49 people participated in this experiment, and then I have lag 1, 3, 8. So that's the uh, proximity between surprise and target. Sorry, this is a bit messy, but so you can see that uh, there is a constant line here, which is the baseline uh, non surprise trial, and then uh, the blue one is lag one, uh, red one is lag three, and yellow one is lag eight. So uh, SID was observed, so the, the deficit was dependent upon lag, and then lag three showed accuracy deficit and habituation. So just to summarize, so there was a constant deficit of lag one, so it was very low and it didn't habituate. So that's the mystery of lag one. We are trying to analyze, like really explore what's going on and 
uh, my poster uh, is about like one uh, in the visual domain. So it's it's a mysterious lag. Uh, in attentional blink, uh, this is a bit side of a side note, but there's a lag one sparing, and there are many explanations about it. And then, so is it masking? Is it? Uh, um, it does it have advantage because it's too close to T1? So there are many explanations. So uh, that doesn't really represent orienting response because it doesn't habituate that fast. So we're try still trying to see what's going on at lag one, but the most important lag here is lag three. Uh, so it shows deficit and habituation, and lag eight, no deficit, similar to um, attentional blink. So uh, just to recap, it's like this. So the red line uh, habituates very quickly compared to lag one. So uh, next, I wanted to kind of manipulate the frequency of surprise and then its consistency. So what happens in that case if I uh, manipulate it same versus varying stimulus surprise? So in same condition, the stimulus, uh, uh, surprise stimulus stays the same. And in varying condition, I always use different surprises. So what happens to uh, habituation rate and attention um, accuracy deficit? And then I also varied uh, the density of surprise. So, so when it's a same surprise, there is a habituation. And then there it's faster for 10%. And then... Uh, Sorry, sorry, faster for 20%. So uh, they represent significant differences. So, so when I vary the surprises, it doesn't really habituate. So, so this is quite interesting because it just happens around 300 millisecond uh, stimulus onset synchrony. But it kind of shows you what our brain is doing. Like when we hear surprise, we are kind of quickly evaluating the identity of the surprise. And then if it's the same, it habituates. But if it keeps changing, we keep evaluating the identity of the surprise and keep reorienting uh, our attention. So this one shows uh, much less habituation for the varying surprise. And this is uh, just a visualization of uh, effect of heterogeneity and density. So for the first graph, it, uh, it's representing heterogeneity. And then uh, surprise magnitude represents how much uh, accuracy deficit you have. So the higher uh, SID magnitude represents more deficit. So you can see that uh, same surprise habituates quicker than varying surprise. And then 10% and 20%, 10 uh, uh, sorry, 20% surprise density has less uh, surprise magnitude. So, so the, that's the rarity and the frequency, uh, sorry, a rarity and then the consistency of the surprise. It's quite intuitive, but it kind of shows you in an empirical way what's happening uh, in surprise. And then the paradigm is very simple, but uh, it's very useful because it's so robust. Every time I run an experiment, it, it can be replicated. So I, I really love it. Like uh, we use attentional blink, and it, it's very robust, but it's the same for audit audition. So it's very useful to investigate many aspects of surprise. So at last, I wanted to see whether this paradigm is really tapping onto stim stimulus-driven uh, limitation. So how do I do it? Uh, so we combined. SID and AAB. AAB is auditory attentional blink. So we ask participants to do dual tasks, identify T1 
and uh, T2, uh, and also uh, on some critical trials, we took surprise stimulus. Uh, so 200 people and then control t uh, group, which they didn't have to do T1. So that's the kind of standard manipulation for attentional blink because uh, control group, we remove uh, T1 task to see what it's like without goal-directed interference to do the T2 task. So it's getting a bit confusing, but uh, this is uh, what we got. So our uh, first graph, surprise-induced deafness, was observed, and auditory attentional blink was also observed. And then the third one is the, uh, the third uh, scatter plot is what we were trying to get. So when we um, correlate SID residuals and AAB residuals, residuals is a bit of a bit more sophisticated technique to regress out the baseline variance. And then by doing that, we can see the variance of the surprise magnitude. So that's what we did. And then we got a significant correlation, uh, our value of 0.26. So this is a correlation matrix. So, uh, two steps, sorry. Uh, so SID and AAB, so uh, the correlation showed that SID magnitude is partially dissociable from that of uh, AAB magnitude. So it's partially dissociable and then there is of course, uh, from this result, there is a part that overlaps uh, between goal-directed and stimulus-driven tension. So that's a, a bit of an interesting to uh, thing for us because uh, I remember Andrew's talk yesterday about <laughs> goal-directed and stimulus-driven uh, overlap. Is, is that where consciousness Emerge, so that's a very interesting finding. And then, so SID represents attentional limitation of stimulus-driven process. So, uh, going back to Husserl, um, he said that consciousness is an intentional act. So, in surprise. It's very interesting uh, because recently there was a paper written by Trotto, 2023, that it's a very sophisticated involuntary process. Our consciousness is always evaluating what's going on in the environment and doing a statistical kind of a probability calculation to always predict the future. So it's really um, act uh, of like uh, evaluating what we perceive and then it also it's related to my poster in attentional capture literature they often use aggregated mean of certain lags or certain condition but here we are also incorporating habituation slope to the analysis and then that is uh, by Trotto uh, he says it's very important to incorporate habituation analysis in attentional capture because habituation is not a peripheral um, perceptual um, kind of uh, uh, like fatigue or those peripheral things it's a central process and an important part of attention capture, attentional capture or attention or even consciousness. So it's uh, very important to include habituation, uh, I think, in, when we study attentional capture. Oh, sorry, I swapped. Uh, this was the second point. Sorry. The first point is what is the experience of su surprise itself? So what about pain? Is it surprise? or how much of pain is surprise, or how much of it is the pure experience of pain. We, we don't really know, 
And then that's a very interesting research questions to uh, kind of address. The very like a big portion of human experience, we try to avoid pain. So that's a tactile domain of surprise. And then, what about clinical populations? So there was uh, you know, mentioned about P3B of uh, among autistic uh, population. And what about, what about P3A novelty, uh, P300? And do they have kind of weaker um, orienting response? And then that will be very useful for us practitioners because when we do assessment, it's quite qualitative and uh, you know, we don't have much uh, quantified uh, cutoff point to really be, to feel comfortable. And then this kind of paradigm is very simple, not so taxing to patients. And if we include like a pupil metry, it's also quite uh, sophisticated now and very easy to set up. So I think that's a uh, quite exciting um, future direction. All right, and then um, I thank all my lab mates for allowing me to do this fun research. And then thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about our work. Thank you very much. Thanks for the great talk. Um, nice. Very interesting data. Um, have, have you or has anyone tried any cross model surprise inducing blindness? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, is it, is it published? Yeah. How, how, how does it work? It, it, does it work? Uh, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. It, it's <laughs> not uh, like. It, it works. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're trying to, yeah. Uh, analyze, organize. Okay. So, yeah, yes. Okay. But th th there is uh, cross modal interference. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. And uh, I have one uh, two questions. So, the first question is how do you uh, manipulate the price? Because it can be probability of the stimuli or it can manipulate in other more complicated ways. So that would be my first question. And the second question would be how long that surprise will last? Will that affect the next trial? Thank you. So um, surprise for the visual domain, it's purely, I would say, qualitative or categorical when it's a letter that's the expected part of the RSVP we flash face or apple or something that's totally out of, uh, that's not compatible with the current category that you're perceiving. And then for the audit audition, so for the task that you guys did, so we call it pure tone task. So we put uh, spoken letters or like, there's a freesound.org, they, they have many uh, car honking or symbol clashing and those things we use as surprise. And then, but for audition, actually, even though we use pure tone uh, task, uh, complex tone also works. Well, what I mean by complex tone is this. Uh, so pure tone is a sine wave, uh, very kind of smooth sine wave. And then we average those wave frequency and make it very, kind of bumpy and then it's still a non-semantic stimulus but it also catches attention because it's qualitatively different when you hear uh, that tone so we use that uh, as a surprise and it works and then also for a visual case uh, suddenly flashing red letter although it's in the same category it also works and uh, other uh, so for the habituation for SID, uh, 2010 paper by Asplan showed that it habituated very quickly. So the first trial was like zero uh, 
accuracy and then around 50 and then 75 and so around three trials suffer but for audition it's like around six to nine trials and then but when we uh, run experiment in other uh, using other stimulus and other participants it varies a bit and then we don't really know uh, why they vary a bit but it's not a significant variation but when you do a significant uh, tweaking like uh, rarity frequency change and things like that then you see a, a stati statistically significant difference in habituation rate thank you I think we can take one short, one more short question if there's any. Oh, thank you. This study is very interesting. Okay. I try to be ask a short question. The first one is, uh, I wonder, uh, maybe I didn't notice, but how long is the like one that oh. you said always keep the effect? That one is uh, around one hundred seventeen. Uh, millisecond. Okay. So, yeah. I noticed that because actually uh, in our lab we noticed a, a serious study that is discussing discussing about the cycles of our brain wave and their perception performance. So uh, one of the ideas that uh, when the stimulus is falling in certain like certain stages of your brain wave, and maybe you can notice that sometimes you can not, and that's related to your uh, brain activity. So maybe we can have further discuss on that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and another thing, sorry, the second one is that uh, you vary the uh, surprise stimulation and the uh, intensity of the stimulation, right? The 10, 20, 10 or 20 percentage. Yes. And yes. actually, I noticed that because uh, I feel that it is something like uh, when your surprise is, I mean, whether you can habituate actually depends on whether the surprise can provo provide more information. So whether the surprise is informative will decide whether the surprise can be habitu habituated. So if you repeat it many times or you change it every time, then in the situation re of repeat, then the, the surprise does not provide any new information, but in the varying condition, the surprise is always informative. So maybe uh, my, my feeling is that maybe there's a possibility for that. Yes, yes, definitely. And then Kahneman uh, talked about it uh, many decades ago. Like uh, it's like 200 milliseconds where you do the quick evaluation of the identity of the uh, kind of source of perturbation in the uh, expectation and then, then there is this very quick evaluation going on and then but it's quite literally surprising to see that it has this much uh, it's visible to this extent because it's such a short uh, duration of time like because we had a 350 millisecond for lag 3 but our it, within the time frame, the evaluation of the identity of the surprise is finished. That's why we see no habituation or kind of much, how to say, uh, less steep habituation for the varying uh, surprise condition. Thank you very uh, much. Welcome. Uh, we have to move on to the next presentation. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, our next speaker is Sean Ming Hong, also known as Sean, and Sean is now a assist assistant professor at Waseda University in Japan, and today he's going to talk about attention gates and conscious processes. Okay. Yeah, so um, we kind of all know that attention gates or manipulates our conscious processes, right? And conscious talk kind of nicely you know, talks about and you know, attention modulates the border between unconscious processes and conscious processes. Basically, you know, without attention, things disappear sometimes. I'm gonna go a little further, further and to talk about how attention modulates something that's totally unconscious or invisible to us. Right, I'm gonna show you data from 
psychophysics, uh, from fMRI, and from some aging data to try to convince you that this is really happening. And try to challenge the idea of you know, the full, fully automatic uh, account of unconscious processes. Right. Um, so over the past few decades, we are getting kind of more and more data showing that you, you, you see you know, unconscious or subliminal processes uh, kind of everywhere. This is just a very kind of limited, uh, limited um, uh, list for visual processes from very low level like orientation uh, processes to uh, high levels such as phase or, or you know all kinds of linguistic processes. Yeah, all this has been shown. To, you know, people are able to process this information without having conscious awareness of the stimulus. And they uh, also affect our behavior and the brain activity. But then this is not you know uncontroversial at all. Look, look into the data, right? There's a lot of kind of studies showing that conscious awareness might be required sometimes, or you know, some of the studies cannot be replicated. And I think I'm trying to propose something to kind of understand or trying to kind of resolve this conflict. And I think one of the problems is one of the problems is that the nature of this uh, subliminal or unconscious processing is not very well understood. So, uh, for example, one of the most kind of well-known claim feature of unconscious or something processing is automatic. You see that a lot in textbooks, in papers. Basically, every time you, you see you know, unconscious processing, people say, "Ah, oh, it's you know, automatic." And by automatic, a lot of times we mean it doesn't consume attention, it doesn't require attention, it's free attentive, or it's attention free. So today, I'm going to challenge this idea and ask: Is this really true? Right, so uh, I'm not the first one to think about that. If you look into the literature, right? actually 15, 20 years ago, there's quite a few, there's a few studies on this, focusing on kind of the lower level features. Uh, for example, uh, in 2006, uh, Dale Fakana and colleagues already showed that if you ask participants to pay attention to certain orientation, right, an unconscious uh, same orientation, uh, if you look into the, say, the adaptation effect, it modulates that effect. So if you pay attention to the same orientation, then you see uh, that changes the adaptation, right? But then how about the other end? How about more high-level uh, processes? So if you look at the kind of the hierarchy of visual processing from low to high level, right? From the lower end, we, we get a few studies showing that if you ask participants to pay attention to certain orientations or certain features of the stimulus, you know, it modulates the processes of that orientation. Or, or that feature, even when you know, participants don't see it. On the other hand, for the more high level end, we kind of got nothing. So my first question today is, can attention modulate uh, unconscious semantic processing, the, the high level end, right? So to kind of answer that question, we devised a, a double strip paradigm, that's how we call it, uh, a few years ago. And the idea behind this is, I mean, it's based on strip, and everybody here is probably quite familiar with the strip paradigm. Basically, we have this color word inconsistent word stimuli, right? And then if I ask you to, uh, to, to name the color, usually it's a harder task. You get kind of pretty strong uh, semantic interference if you want to name the word. On the other hand, if I ask you to name the word, a lot easier. Uh, the color interference is somewhat weak. Uh, in this task, we naturally define these two conditions as the high-low condition and the low-low condition. So color naming color, high-low, word naming easier, low-low. As simple as that. Now, this is kind of the first layer of the strip. The second layer is that on top of this, on top of, you know, before we present a target, we present a prime, or you can also call it a distractor. So this prime can be either semantically congruent or incongruent uh, to the target. Right? So want to know if this kind of invisible, invisible prime can affect the target uh, response. And what's more interesting here is want to know whether that you know, interference would change based on the load of the task. So how we use the, our attention in the task, we're going to change how we process unconscious information. So let me walk you through uh, one trial here. This is using what I'm wearing here. It's using the <laughs> interocular <laughs> suppression paradigm. Yeah, I, I had to prepare for this. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so what you're seeing here is I'm going to show you uh, one kind of stream presented to the non-dominant eye, one to the dominant eye, and the, the right side is closer to their actual percent. So this is using something we call a discontinuous flash suppression. You have, if you are interested in the details, you can, I can talk about that later. But basically, what we're trying to do here is we show uh, a, a prime which is suppressed by this interocular uh, suppression. And right after that, we present a target. In the harder task, the high-low task, we ask them to name the target. 
So all those tasks get passed them to them uh, that worked. Uh, and then to ensure that they really didn't see the prime, uh, at the end of every, every trial, we ask them to do this uh, two alternatives, force choice, two AFC uh, location task. Basically, we ask them, you know, what's the prime presented above or below the dots. And then the rationale behind this is, you know, if their performance is a change, right? They probably didn't see it. Across, I think, eight experiments we ran, uh, their performance was basically a chance, suggesting that they really didn't see the prime. Right, so with this invisible prime, does the prime semantic uh, congruency or incongruency affect target response? That's what we're asking. The answer is yes. So this is the word naming condition. So remember the easier condition. The easier condition, if this, uh, the prime and target, they, they have different semantics, people slow down by about 5%. Uh, as compared to you know when they have the same meaning. So this is the low low condition. In the high low condition, exactly the same uh, stimulus, the same procedure, except that now we ask them to name to name the color, the effect disappeared completely. Right. So even with this simple manipulation, uh, this already challenges that you know unconscious processing is like fully automatic. Because if it's all fully automatic then whatever we ask the participants to do right, shouldn't change the effect at all. So we went on to do quite a few things to try to make sure that this is really about attention. I'm just gonna show you one, which is as a kind of an evil psychophysicist. Usually we ask them to do a lot of trials, right? So the first thing I thought of was, I should just ask them to do 2,000 trials on this, right? And this is gonna be a practice effect, right? So when, when they got better and better, then you know the load of the task should be lowered, right? So if this hypothesis or theory is really true, then when the load of the task is lower, right? We should see the same effect again. Lucky for them, I already asked them to do a lot in this experiment, so they didn't need to repeat it. So I asked them to do about 350 trials in this task. That already allowed me to split the trials into the early trials and the later trials. So I already see some practice effects with uh, yeah, about 100 trials. Yeah. And then we ran the same analysis in the first quarter trials and the last quarter trials. In the first quarter trials, the task was you know, supposedly uh, still difficult. Again, there was no effect at all. There's no unconscious was me unconscious semantic interference. But in the later trials, when when the test got easier, we saw a very similar interference as what we saw in the low low task. So it was slowed down about by about five to ten percent when the two when the target and the prime share different meanings. Right. So with that, uh, the basically what we found here is the subliminal primes incongruency, semantic incongruency, slow down target response. And this is modulated by you know, the task load, basically how they use their task, uh, how they use attention in the task. Right? So if it's in the low low condition, you get kind of a strong, robust interference. In the high low condition, initially there's no interference at all, but after some practice, the, the interference would kind of emerge. Right. So uh, after this, we went on to try to look for the neural correlates of this attention modulation. This is actually quite I mean, the two hypotheses here are pretty kind of straightforward. I mean, this attentional modulation can be realized in like high-level regions or even low-level regions, right? Because we're looking at a, a, a kind of a high-level effect here. So that's how kind of I we designed experiments, right? So the we we kind of bring the whole thing to fMRI. This uh, experiment is I mean, this procedure is very similar. Uh, every participant had to finish one word naming session and one color naming session. And the critical thing is that we had this uh, localizer uh, scan uh, or session. I'll talk about that in a, little, uh, in a bit. And basically what we're asking here is does the subliminal prime congruency or incongruency affect target activity? So target activity is what we're looking for here. Right? And the reason why we're focusing on this uh, localizer scan is because uh, based on a lot of previous uh, literature, if you don't if you just simply do a bow activity kind of analysis, whole brain kind of analysis, you usually don't get much uh, subliminal activity in your brain because of very low signal to noise ratio. So we had to localize some regions. And what we picked here uh, is uh, three regions, basically. So we did the uh, red mapping, tried to localize the V1, and then we throw in a bunch of like word uh, conditions, true word, fake word, scramble words, so that we can get the, uh, we can localize the semantic region and the word form region. So basically, these are the three regions that we'll be focusing on later. Right. And then these are individually and functionally defined. Right. So as expected, the first thing I did was I ran a whole brain analysis, all activity, was 
nothing. Right, so this nicely replicated and no results in the literature. And then uh, Yale Fong is gonna talk about that uh, later. Basically, her analysis kind of show very similar results. Right, so then the critical thing is we look into the data in the uh, RI analysis uh, from left to right, more low level regions all the way to more higher level regions. So V1, uh, fusiform to I, uh, inferior frontal gyrus. Right, so this is the word naming condition, the easier condition. So from the psychophysical data, what we saw here is there was interference. And that's what we saw in the data as well. So basically, if you look into V1, this is just bow activity. If you look into V1, where they share the same meaning, uh, in a congruent condition, V1 gets stronger activity. As simple as that. We didn't see uh, the same attentional module. Uh, we didn't see the same uh, activity change in the higher regions, such as uh, the fusiform area and the inferior frontal gyrus. Right, in the color naming condition, in the previous experiment, we didn't see any effect at all. And that's what we saw uh, in the FMR data as well. So in lower regions or higher regions, we didn't see any difference between the congruent and incongruent uh, 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 prime target stimulus. Right, so this kind of nicely replicated what we found behaviorally, but this is just the univariate analysis. And working on the multivariate analysis uh, here, so basically, as uh, Abba mentioned yesterday, you know, when it gets to the frontal areas, it's a lot harder to localize things. You know, when you look into the inferior frontal gyrus that I define individually, everybody's kind of quite different. Yeah, so I think a, a kind of a multi-voxel pet analysis would work better. Yeah. Right, so basically our brain imaging data kind of supports what we found uh, in the uh, psychophysical experiments. Uh, the attentional modulation specifically is realized in the early visual cortex. <coughs> and so, like I say, I'm trying to challenge this idea of the fully automatic account of uh, subliminal unconscious processing. And I think both our uh, imaging data and behavioral data uh, suggest that. Right. And I do believe that these results can at least partially explain the inconsistent results in the field. So basically, you know, before this, right, when people design experiments to try to replicate an unconscious effect, they don't really consider attention, right? You might recruit people who have uh, different attention capacity. You might, you might be using a test that requires more attention or less attention or whatever. This is something that people don't think about before, but maybe this could explain some inconsistencies in the field. Right, um, and ever since I saw these results, I really want to have a disease model. So basically, you know, you can imagine that if we find people who have some sort of attention deficits, as them to do the exact same experiment, right? that should be kind of a lesion model, right? You should, you should make the effect disappear. I didn't have these people. But then instead, I got some, I think, even better uh, participants from collaborators, which is uh, some older individuals. Right, so these are uh, in the older individuals that have higher or lower risk to develop Alzheimer's. Right, and what's nice about these people are uh, is they, they are cognitively uh, healthy, they're normal. Right? This is way before they develop any symptoms. But then, in a lot of different experiments that they, they did uh, to these individuals, they constantly see that uh, when in a demanding task, these individuals seem to kind of u utilize different kind of different amount of attention to the task according to what they found in the health outcome. Basically, for the high-risk individuals, it seems that they, they always use kind of more. They, they always have, you know, kind of uh, uh, weaker, uh, weaker, yeah, maybe weaker alpha frequency. Uh, they call it alpha ERD uh, in, in these patients. So basically, it suggests that, you know, they, they kind of utilize more attention in the task, even when they have kind of uh, very similar comparable behavior performance. Right. So that's kind of the, uh, the beginning of uh, this journey to kind of collect aging data, right? And for me, it's a very kind of a conceptual thing to, to run experiments in the older individuals, but then they think that it's a practical use of uh, this kind of approach because if you look at the Alzheimer's progression, right? When someone has developed symptoms, which is in the later this, uh, dementia period, right? It's usually too late. This is not reversible and there's no cure. But then a lot of studies have dedicated to uh, try to find kind of early biomarkers, right? Because if you can find these biomarkers, say, 
10, 15 years before the symptoms develop. You can kind of slow down the progression in some direction. Um, right now, if you uh, try to get the uh, uh, corticospinal fluid from us, from you know, typical individuals, uh, and then you, you analyze the amyloid beta or you analyze the tau, you can actually estimate the risk level of us. But then it's way too expensive and invasive, right? You cannot do that uh, everybody. So it would be nice to have some sort of uh, behavioral simple biomarker very early in, the, in this progression, right? So this is kind of a critical period. We want to have a biomarker when, or they want to have a biomarker when people are still cognitively normal, right? They are, they are still healthy, but then we can tell whether you know, someone's high risk or low risk. Right? And then my hypothesis here is kind of, or at least uh, the working hypothesis here is this is this could kind of uh, suggest some sort of implicit cognitive decline. Right, right so uh, let me talk a little bit more about these uh, individuals. Uh, so basically, they have you know, gone through a, a, a whole series of uh, neuropsychological tests, uh, MRI, and then they are verified that they, you know, various kinds of uh, tests that they are cognitively healthy, right? And they have comparable, um, I'll talk about that in a bit. So basically, they are, and then you know, they have done uh, number of punctures so that we know their um, uh, amyloid beta 42 and tau cutoff uh, uh, ratio. We use this ratio to determine whether they are high risk or low risk based on another study. So data are the same, you know, these kind of two things a lot. Pets basically means uh, pathological. So these are the high risk participants. Uh, nets are the normal participants. They have, they have normal biochemical status. But uh, if you talk to them, you interact with them. There's no difference. So this is a double blind experiment. You know, before I read the experiment, I had no idea, and the participants had no idea of their uh, status either. All right. So these are the we collected about 20 participants uh, in each uh, kind of classification, uh, and then they have comparable age, they have comparable uh, education, IQ, and all that. And uh, this is just to show that this uh, kind of biomarker we're using is actually. So in an ongoing study, uh, none of the low-risk participants decline after four years, but about 40% of the participants decline uh, uh, when they are kind of classified as high-risk industry. Right, so this is indeed um, you know, predictive. Right, so stroke. Um, so we asked them to do a stroke, and we, we made it even harder for the older in individuals. And uh, so basically, you know, this is what I explained just now. You know, they either respond to the word word color, but then we added in the task switching component. So basically, every trial has uh, two trials. Every trial has two stimuli, and they are either naming the colors or naming the word, or, or sometimes they have to switch. So naming the color for the first one and naming the word for the second one to so make it even harder. So the interesting thing about this experiment is that you know we we insert it in this messed. Uh, prime right before the presentation of the second uh, stimulus, which is the actual target. Right? And this congruency of the uh, prime and, and the target is determined by the response trigger. I mean, there is no actual explicit uh, task to the prime. But then, you know, when they see the word red, right, they're supposed to make a response, say response one. And when they see this word green, right, it's underlined, so they're supposed to report the color, which is red. So this is considered congruent. Trial. So based on that, we can analyze the you know how prime target congruency affects their behavior. Right. Uh, we couldn't do trial by trial awareness test. These people are kind of old. Yeah, they cannot do like 500 you know psychophysical trial experiments. Yeah, but then we did manage to convince them to stay for another five minutes for this uh, post experiment prime awareness test. Yeah, they weren't very happy about it because not because of the time because. Throughout the test, they claim that they didn't see anything at all. Yeah, this was just a joke. Yeah, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the, the sequence uh, is exactly the same. So basically, they just need to uh, make a 2FC response where the, the prime was created on the left or right. Uh, across all the participants, um, the, 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 the performance was actually slightly lower than chance. Yeah, but this is quite consistent. So I think they suggest that uh, the prime is invisible or at least in place to our participants. All right, so with that, 
we actually found uh, kind of an interesting through your interaction. So the switching component doesn't really work. But if you look at interaction here, is the interaction between the stroke effect and the congruency, which is actually what we found in the younger participants. So we analyze the data exactly in the same way, which is we look into the, uh, the trials when you know, the test is harder versus when the test is easier. So when the test is harder, which is naming the color, right, you see a difference between the high risk and low risk uh, populations, which is you know, the, the high risk population, right, they are interfered by an incongruent prime by about 5%. So they slow down by about 5%, very similar to our you know, young, healthy participants. And the low risk participants, they are not affected. On the other hand, when the test gets easier, neither of the group got interfered by the prime. Right, so I'll explain why this is the case uh, with another study. But basically what I can say right now is that this seems to suggest that uh, this could be a kind of a nice disease model to our, our study. Uh, because if these uh, two groups of participants are using their attention differently in the task, right, that would somehow kind of translate into how they process unconscious or subliminal information in the task, right? And this is what we that's that's what we found here. Uh, at first, we thought uh, maybe we can explain that by saying that uh, for for pets, for the high risk population, right, maybe this is about uh, inhibition of interference. So they fail to inhibit this distracting information, and that's why they got interfered. That's not the case. Uh, so basically, in later experiments, we try to kind of tease apart two possibilities. The first one was what I just talked about. The second one was maybe this is some sort of active processing. The, the, the high-risk uh, uh, individuals, right, they are actually actively processing you know, the unconscious distracting information, and that's why they got distracted. Right, and this could be due to a, some sort of attention spillover, meaning that in the high effort task or high load task, right, they need to focus a lot more attention on the task, and this attention actually translated to the unconscious stimulus. Right, so again, to test that, we need practice. But then, like I say, I cannot ask them to do a thousand trials in, in a session, but luckily, this is a longitudinal study. Yeah, so they actually did quite a few sessions of this. That which allows us to look at the change uh, uh, in attention resources. Right, so pra practice will actually predict two kind of opposite effects uh, based on how practice interacts with the subliminal effect. So, for example, if it's really about failure of inhibition, practice should lead to better uh, inhibition. Because now I have more attention, right? So I actually have more attention to inhibit this distracting information. On the other hand, uh, if it's really about active processing, active processing of unconscious information, then practice should lead to additional attention. But then they would use this attention, additional attentional resources to process the unconscious information, meaning that they will get even worse. Right. So these would predict like very different results. So what we found was what I call practice makes it imperfect, makes it even worse. If you look at just the red dots, which are the uh, uh, the high risk population, the more practice effect they show in the later session, you know, the, 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 the worse they got, the more interference there is. Right? But on the other hand, for the low risk population, it's the other way around. The more practice they had, right, they actually had you know, less interference in the later sessions. So for, uh, for the low risk population, it seems that they are more similar to healthy young participants. So right now we are trying to kind of propose a, a, a mechanism, a toy mechanism to explain this, and I believe that attention is kind of utilized differently in, the, in, the, in these two groups of uh, individuals. So imagine that if they have some sort of hidden uh, attention capacity difference, right? So let's say nets have you know, more, uh, and then pets, the high risk, they have like, kind of less. When you ask them to do a high effort test, right? It's really hard for the pets, right? So they occupy basically almost all the uh, capacity here. But after some practice, it gets easier, right? So for pets and nets, you know, uh, the, the attention required gets uh, less, right? And somehow this kind of freed up space that you can see up here, right, is kind of utilized differently in these two groups. So for nets, they use these additional uh, attentional resources to suppress unwanted uh, unconscious information. For pets, it seems that they use these you know, additional attentional resources to process this information actively, right, so, and that's why they got even more uh, inter uh, interfered, right. So I think these results 
although they are not very easy to explain, at least show that you know, how they use their attention actually gates or, or manipulates you know, how they process unconscious information in the task. Right? And this could be a key to kind of predict whether you know, you know, this person has you know, cognitive, sorry, healthy or, or uh, pathological aging and a very kind of early biomarker, behavioral biomarker, right? So, uh, yeah, that's what I just say. And um, just to conclude, so I hope I have convinced you that with you know, multiple track of data, you know, psychophysical data, FMR, and aging, they all to they together, they all indicate this kind of attentional modulation or regulations on conscious processes. Right. And I think these uh, results call for a lot of um, further questions, such as how you know, supraliminal and subliminal information compete for these limited uh, attentional resources, and how our brain you know, distributes the resources, and why subliminal information even requires attention, because you know, a lot of people thought that it, it didn't, it just automatic. Right. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, Brown at NTU, and in my post lab lab at uh, Caltech, Shinji Motors lab, and my collaborators uh, at the uh, Medical Research Institution, and in uh, various funding agencies. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. This is really, really wonderful work. Um, I'd like to ask you whether you can speculate um, about different modalities uh, because you presented like subliminal visual perception would you expect the same kind of like tendency in um, other sensory modalities uh, I see. Um, so usually it's a lot harder to suppress auditory stimulus if you want to make it complicated but that's what i'm trying right now so maybe next corn i'll be able to present something <laughs> if 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 i succeed yeah, but I, I was thinking more like, um, so because auditory still stands as some sort of like um, external stimuli coming from the external world, whereas like you can have also sensory experiences and also related to conscious experiences that are more like close to the body, like um, smell and touch and potential interoception. Because we don't just see, we don't just like hear, we, we have all the time basically um, you know, multiple yeah, yeah. Uh, sensory experiences, like integrated, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I understand why people do, um, you know, research and vision because it's so um, it's easy, right? So it's like low hanging fruit in the in the tree, you just like uh, take it. But um, I think to make um, like interesting claims about conscious experiences, we definitely need to look at. Uh, more than one sensory modality. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, I, maybe we'll find actually something different in others. Yeah, I entirely agree with you. So basically what, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find kind of different suppression paradigms for various modalities. And auditory would be the first one to try. Wonderful, thank you. I look forward to the, <laughs> to the results. We can take one more quick question. Hi, thanks a lot for the talk, guys. It's really, really uh, interesting. I have a, a, a question about your, your participants, because you, um, you've you taken them when they were 70-something and yeah. so on. So, so and, and you have this idea that they have these different ways of using attention. So how, how early <laughs> do you think this difference should kick in? I mean, is it an effect that it would show up with early signs of yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't have data to, to show that, but then, I mean, they're actively recruiting more participants like every year. So supposedly this might, I mean, we're hoping that this might occur like very early in the trajectory. Right? And right now it's kind of random because we want to kind of track these participants for a very long time, right? So there's a selection bias, which is usually the more educated and, and wealthy participants who join this experiment because they have the time, yeah, and they have the resources. So uh, one of the things we've been thinking of, a lot about is how do we kind of spread to the, you know, to the common people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, right now, I don't know how early this will occur, but then um, um, I think the, the kind of the youngest participant in our kind of 
data pool is around 65-ish to 70. Yeah, and we can already see some difference around the age. Yeah, very interesting the set of the age. Okay, now let's thank our speaker again. Okay, our last speaker of this session is uh, Ian Ru Fong, and uh, Ian Ru is now a uh, postdoc postdoctoral uh, research fellow at National Taiwan University, and she's going to talk about decoding facial information without awareness under discontinuous class oppression. Okay, thanks. Well, today I'm going to share a study related to unconscious perception of facial information. Uh, with regard to this issue, in fact, in fact, there are a lot of a lot of study have been done on this. For example, using binocular rate based uh, paradigm prior study demonstrate that when faces were suppressed into invisible, relevant neural activations were decreased or even diminished. However, there's another study demonstrate that even though the when faces were suppressed into invisible, and um, even though when those activations were reduced, but they are still measurable. Furthermore, when some other components such as emotional information was included, the activation from face areas such as STS is robust. Furthermore, there is another study demonstrate that using univariate, using multivariate but not univariate, they showed that the categorical information could be distinguished even under invisible condition. Of course, there are many uh, other studies which are not listed here, but most of them are not agree with each other. So here we assume that those discrepancies may come from the use stimuli, paradigm, and analytical method. So the primary purpose of this study is to explore optimal measurements for unconscious processing of facial information. And to, in, to achieve this, three improvements was made, were made in this study. First, to increase signal to noise ratio, instead of commonly used static stimuli, we also use dynamic stimuli, which is presumably more informative. Second, uh, apart from using standard BCFS paradigm, here we use discontinuous flash suppression paradigm, which allows for longer suppression duration. I'll talk about more details later. Lastly, in addition to univariate, we also did multivariate analysis. And in brief, with these three improvements, two fMRI experiments were conducted. And for each experiment, we want to examine where does it the brain can process visual information under invisible conditions using univariate, program decoding, and RI decoding. Further, we also want to investigate where whether relevant results will differ between static and dynamic presentations of our stimuli. Uh, before I go into uh, experiment one and two, I would like to introduce our paradigm and experimental design because these two parts were almost identical across two experiments. First is paradigm, and here comes our DCFS trial procedure. And um, similar to like, standard BCFS, here we also present colorful and salient mandra to people's dominant eye while our target to their non-dominant eye. However, different from Conventional BCFS, each trial under DCFS consists of five repetition of suppression period, and each followed by a blank, as we can see here. And therefore, we have five cycles of on and off presentation. And across all these five cycles, the target of our contrast always ramp up from zero to a predestinate level, and that for mountain always remain 100%. And during these five cycles, people have to do a detection test. That is, they were asked to press the button whenever they found invisible target became visible. And after that, they have to report on which side they saw the target. And this is our localization test. And notably, if during those uh, suppression pe period, if people did not report uh, detection, they, still, they were still asked to make their best best guesses during the localization test. Besides, this is the presentations of our unconscious condition. And if it is conscious condition, we will simply remove the presentations of our mandarin and present our target with full contrast across 
those five cycles of suppression period. Now we move on to our design and use experiment one as an example. In experiment one, we use faces and objects as our stimuli. And both faces and objects were presented statically and dynamically. So therefore, we have four stimulus type. And then those four stimulus type were presented in conscious and unconscious conditions. So technically, we have eight conditions. And during the formal study, each participant was asked to complete a two-session scan, each lasts for one hour and consists of eight rounds. And during the formal study, the presentation order of our conscious and unconscious conditions was counterbalanced, so as the stimulus type. And this is experiment one, and if it is experiment two, we simply replace object with things, and all the other designs remain identical. We use static object as our target. So later on the right side, you will see a powerful mountain. And on the left side, you will see our target. And during each suppression period, you will see a static object image. And after five suppression period, you, you will see a localization task. Duration, we, we present a static object image across those five uh, suppression period. And here comes uh, another demo, and we use dynamic face. Once again, we will have powerful mountain on the right side, and this time during suppression period, you will see a dynamic face. So it's very thin, but during the suppression period, we actually present a, a facial expression. And after the five repetition of suppression, you will also see a localization task. And let's talk more about analysis. And during experiment one, basically we've done you know, variate um, whole brain. I don't know why, but I thought I missed some slides here, and th this is not the latest <laughs> version that, that I have. But anyway, I, I was explain our analytical uh, pipeline here first. So, okay, so experiment one, we've done the variable Hopper decoding and RI decodings. And our data from con and on con conditions were always analyzed separately. And during experiment one, for the first two part of analysis, we always focus, focus on the overall facing fact that that means we always combine static and dynamic trial together and always compare faces against objects. And as for our eye here in experiment one, we use individual base data and we focus on FFA, but this time we extend static and dynamic stimuli separately. And notably, our analysis was on, were only done on only done for unconscious condition. And in these experiments, we recruit a total of 16 participants. Now we move on to uh, our result versus univariate. So uh, when we test on overall effect in conscious conditions, we found that visible faces always have a greater activation than visible objects over occipital area. But in unconscious condition, none of the region will observe. No? Next, we did a whole brain decoding using linear SVM coupled with searchlight algorithm. First, in conscious condition, we found that visible faces could be decoded in occipital area. Uh, 
Also, even in our conscious condition, we found that invisible faces could be differentiated from invisible objects in middle temporal genres and lingual. Furthermore, uh, during our eye analysis, we found that bilateral FFA could differentiate dynamic but not static categorical information in uncount conditions. However, as we can see here, our results are not particularly robust, and we assume that maybe it's because the similarity between our used faces and objects, as well as small sample size. That's why in experiment two, uh, we replace our object with scenes and recruit more participants. And apart from these two major change, all the other settings and analytical pipelines were almost ident identical to experiment one. Okay, and these are the stimuli we have in experiment two. Uh, image on the right side are the scene, and those on the left side are faces. And the way we generate in Okay, so here we uh, Okay, I can show you later if people have some question about it. So basically we have our way to generate our dynamic stimuli and put it into those suppression period. And the way we generate dynamic and static stimuli was in experiment two was identical to experiment one. And now we move on to analysis. So as identical to experiment one, here we also have done in the variable hover decoding and RI decoding. And data from Kong and on Kong were always analyzed separately. But here in experiment two, we always examine static and dynamic effects separately. That is, that is for static effect, we compare static phase against Study scenes and dynamic during for dynamic effect we compare dynamic phase against dynamic scenes. As for our eye, apart from the visual base FFA, we also focus on OFA. And once again, our eye analysis was only done for uh, unconscious condition. Now we move on to result. First is you vary. So uh, in conscious conditions, as expected, we found that visible faces have stronger activation for than visible scenes in many regions, regardless of static or dynamic stimuli. So we have result from the result for the static on the left and dynamic on the right. Uh, furthermore, in unconscious conditions, once again, none of the regions were observed while we contrasting faces against scenes under uh, unconscious condition. Next, we did whole brain decoding using linear SVM coupled with search light algorithm. And in conscious condition, we found that visible faces could be decoded across many regions, across regardless of static or dynamic stimuli. Furthermore, uh, even invisible faces could be decoded. For example, a uh, surprise static facial information could be decoded across many regions, including ACC covering SMA, MTG, and dorsal part of SFG. Uh, as for suppressed dynamic facial information, it could be decoded across even more regions, including all of those areas. As for RI recording, we found that both bilateral F FFA and OFA could differentiate dynamic categorical information in on Kong conditions, but only right side of OFA can distinguish static categorical information. Okay, so here comes the conclusion. So first, using univariate method, both both experiments show that no differential activation when stimuli were suppressed as invisible. But a fine grain analysis enabled the decoding of visual cortex and face related area even in an unconscious state, indicating that facial information could be processed without awareness. And besides, in both experiments, we found that dynamic presentation of facial information is more easier to be detected on the unconscious condition. So as a whole, our two experiments suggest that stimuli paradigm and analysis all play a critical role in detecting uh, suppressed or invisible facial information. So thanks to our uh, PI, Brown, and one of the, our co-authors, Sean, our lab members, all of the participants, and all of you being here. Thank you.
open for questions. Yes. Hi, thanks for your talk. And do, do you think that your final finding about uh, the uh, dynamic presentation are more easily to decode? This thing is related to uh, you use CFAS as a masking uh, tool. For example, if like you use backward masking, which is static, then whether it, uh, is there a possibility that um, the static presentation become more easily to decode? Like the, the relationship between the stimuli and the masking, uh, whether they are both dynamic or both static uh, have the influence on it. Thanks for your question. So basically you are asking whether there's any like, interaction between our use monitor and stimuli, right? Especially for dynamic stimuli. Uh, actually, I don't know because I think if we want to make sure that we need to like, make, like, do another experiment, but intuitively I should, it should be fine because as you can see, uh, even our mountain, it also looks dynamically, so it should be powerful enough to also suppress those uh, dynamic presentation of stimuli. Yeah, so I, uh, what I say is that uh, since both are dynamic, mm. so maybe somehow make it more easily to decode. And and if, if you change to use the uh, uh, um, back, backward masking with noise, which is static, then the sta static Static info uh, stimuli will become easily to decode. Yeah, we, we don't know. We, I guess we will need to test on this if we want to know this answer. <laughs>